Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Wednesday, April 14th, 2021. And today we're going to be talking about former Governor Pat McCrory, the governor from North Carolina that signed the ever so controversial bathroom bill that has haunted uh, his governor re-election bid back in 2016, which he lost, which he is now going to uh, be re-entering himself into politics for the 2022 United States Senate election. And I find this to be um, a poor move on the side of the Republican Party. Uh, this is not a good look for the GOP over in North Carolina. This crowds a field that could have been cleared for Mark Walker or Laura Trump, now including a governor who has no business running for this Senate seat. Now, Pat McCrory announced this bid, deeming himself a political outsider, but you can't really argue you're a political outsider when you were literally the governor of the state. You've been in politics for a significant portion of your life, enough that you represented the state on a statewide level. So looking at Pat McCrory, He's not an outsider. He's building his campaign on the idea that he is one, largely in turn to try to uh, push into that Trump legacy and that Trump uh, coattails from the 2020 election. But at the end of the day, it's an argument that can't be made because he's not an outsider. But it's not just that. That's not the only reason why I think Pat McCrory will prove to be detrimental to this Senate race. He is now the second major Republican to announce that he is running. Uh, Laura Trump looks like she might end up running. Ted Budd, a representative from North Carolina's 13th district. Mark Robinson, the lieutenant governor of the state of North Carolina. So the thing is, amongst the Republicans here, we have three Republicans that could run um, in the publicly expressed interest column. I think Laura Trump is certainly would uh, clear the field or wipe out the other candidates. But Mark Walker, former representative. Pat McCrory, former governor. He was the mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina. So looking at him, he's not really an outsider. Keep that in mind. But the reason why we don't see the incumbent running is because Richard Burr has announced that he's out. And the thing is, Richard Burr isn't someone who is unpopular. He's not leaving because he thinks he's going to lose his election bid. Maybe that's somewhere in the back of his mind that North Carolina could be competitive in 2022, which it absolutely will be. But I can tell you now, the Republicans would have fared better had he ran. I think he's done with politics, and since he's announced his retirement, he actually voted to convict President Trump when it came down to the Senate vote. It was a surprise to many people that he voted to convict, but at the end of the day, he has nothing to worry about. When you retire, you're leaving on your own terms. You're telling the voters, I'm leaving. Sorry, but I'm leaving. At the end of the day, you're not being viewed as someone who was ousted by your own constituency, and especially following that vote, I wouldn't be too confident about uh, him having a landslide primary victory, potentially losing that primary, uh, but Richard Burr is out. So that means it's an open seat, which is a, a very good opportunity for former statewide officials, current statewide officials, local officials to run for Senate because this could be their next step. But the thing with uh, Pat McCrory is that he's not someone who I would have viewed as a strong candidate for this Senate race. Looking at North Carolina, if you look at the 2020 presidential election results here, it was a close race. It was won by simply 1.3%. 1.3 percent. To put that in perspective, uh, you know, Nevada went more for Biden than North Carolina did for Trump. Michigan went more for Biden than North Carolina did for Trump. Pennsylvania went more for Biden than North Carolina did for Trump. I believe actually it might be 1.2 percent, so it might be around even. Yeah, so Pennsylvania, and North Carolina on the same level. But the fact is, North Carolina, which was a two-point higher margin for Trump back in 2016, if we zoom in here to North Carolina, you'll see that it was 3.6 percent back in 2016, which means Donald Trump has seen a reduction in support of 2.3 percent. Well, if that trend continues to 2024, the Democratic Party wins here by one point. Or into 2022, you cut that in half, well, we'll see the Republican Party win by less than a quarter of a percentage point. Just looking at North Carolina here, yes, Trump won here in 2016, but he didn't win nearly as much as he did back in 2020. And just looking at what happened in 2016, I don't think I have to remind North Carolina natives, but on the same ballot that Donald Trump won by 3.6%, North Carolina actually elected a Democrat to the governorship. And that governor is Roy Cooper, someone who was reelected in 2020 by the North Carolina constituency, despite Donald Trump winning the state, a larger margin. But the fact remains that Pat McCrory underperformed Donald Trump by margin by four points, 3.8%. Trump's winning by 3.6, you're losing by 0.2. The spread, 3.8%. I'm comfortable enough to round that up to four. So overall, Pat McCrory, who could have been saved had Donald Trump won slightly more in 2016, was ousted by the voters. And you might be wondering why. 
Well, Pat McCrory wasn't exactly popular. He signed the bathroom bill, which ultimately was uh, a huge blow to the reputation of North Carolina. What you see here is that his approval rating did dip down. Um, he is uh, someone who was supposed to be sliding into re-election following that 2012 North Carolina victory. I mean, he won by double digits on the same ballot that Romney won by, outperforming Romney by 10 points. Seriously, outperformed Romney by 10 points, but then underperformed him significantly, underperformed the uh, Republican not as much as, you know, he outperformed by, underperformed by four points, but comparing it to the 2012 margin, it's a significant decrease and a significant dip in support, which means that the voters eventually turned against Pat McCrory. Because this bathroom bill actually harmed the economy in North Carolina, it was as if this was all going on to him. Yes, the state legislature was responsible, but he signed it. I mean, he is someone who is at the, the top, which means whoever is up there, whoever is the governor is going to receive the blame for whatever the state legislature does, whatever is done statewide, because at the end of the day, they are the people who will take the fall and all the credit for things that happen that are bad and things that happen that are good. And let's see here. According to the new morning consult survey, which was done back in September 2016, so that's why it says new, um, it was conducted from May through early September, so months before the election, but gives you a general idea of how the uh, North Carolina public viewed Pat McCrory back then. 46% of voters approve of his performance, 44% do not. His approval rating actually went down from 50 to 46, a reduction of four points, and then an increase in 6% of terms of overall disapproval, a net loss of around 10, depending on, um, you know, if you're adding in the approval versus the disapproval bump. Really, it ultimately ended up with the defeat. And you know, it's not just that. Looking at Pat McCrory's approval rating as he was uh, leaving office, his approval rating did dissipate. Um, just looking at the approval rating between Roy Cooper and Pat McCrory, uh, this is the time period in which uh, McCrory was leaving and Cooper was being sworn in. Uh, but the approval rating was higher for a newly elected Democrat in what was presumably a Republican state versus the outgoing Republican incumbent. And typically during the lame duck session after you've been defeated, voter sentiment starts to improve for you. But that was not the case for Pat McCrory. So the thing is, he's announcing a Senate bid in a state that did not like him even after he had left office. Looking at his approval rating, I think that's warning sign number one for the GOP. But also warning sign number two might be his close ties to President Trump. The cover photo for the Hill article here is him with President Trump. Now, this was back in 2016. But looking at Pat McCrory, I think he's certainly going to try to tap into the uh, support of President Trump because Mark Walker hasn't been endorsed by Donald Trump yet. I think, honestly, Donald Trump is waiting uh, for his daughter-in-law to announce that she's running. But if she doesn't, I think it is going to come down between who can pander to him the most. But at the end of the day, I don't think that North Carolina is going to adore a Trump-like candidate. That's the thing. While Trump did win in North Carolina, it's not as if it was a blowout margin. He didn't make North Carolina as red as he made Ohio and Iowa, despite both of those states going for Obama and North Carolina going for Romney. North Carolina is very much inelastic, but sometimes it does go to the Democratic Party, as it did back in 2016. And Pat McCrory, if the eventual nominee, could be screwing over the GOP's chances at retaining the state. And the reason why it's so important is because if you're looking at the 2022 election uh, ratings that I have produced and that many political pundits have, uh, in a sense, agreed with on a certain level, just looking at the states that are up, North Carolina is not a state the GOP wants to be worrying about. If we're applying the 2020 election results to the map itself, this is what the numbers look like. 52 to 48. The GOP is benefiting with Republicans being in Biden states. There are no Democrats in Trump states, I think, with Montana, West Virginia, Ohio. Um, and I think that might be it in terms of overall Democratic representation. There are very few Democrats in Trump states and very few Republicans in Biden states. But just looking at the 2022 map, um, please let me know if I forgot someone in the uh, Trump states that has a Democratic uh, governor, uh, sorry, senator. But looking at Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, Here's our two states, one with a retiring incumbent, one who will also likely have another retiring incumbent being Wisconsin. I think that the <clears throat> Republican Party is going to try to do everything they can to focus on those two states. But if Pat McCrory ends up the nominee, or even with Mark Walker, I really think both of these guys aren't going to be uh, as inspirational as Trump could have been, or someone of the Trump name. Uh, looking at North Carolina, this is the state that the GOP really does not want to worry about, because they know it will be competitive, 
but they can likely rely on the inel inelasticity of the state, meaning the GOP might come down to a point where it looks competitive, but will almost always win. But in the event that Pat McCrory ends up being the nominee, I don't think the public is going to be too inclined to elect him to the Senate. Obviously, it depends on the year and, you know, whether or not there's energy on his side. But honestly speaking, he's not a popular governor. He's not a popular guy. And also, the Democratic Party has tried this before, tried running uh, governors from certain states. Montana, for example, Steve Bullock, who, to the contrary, was actually a popular governor, someone who was elected in 2016 on the same ballot that Donald Trump was, uh, and actually elected in 2012 on the same ballot uh, Romney won in the state of Montana, re-elected in 2016. But Steve Bullock didn't win. He lost by 10 points. And I'm not trying to compare North Carolina directly to Montana. I'm just going to point out that sometimes some of these governors don't fare as easily as you might think. Winning on a statewide level in a governorship is very different than being sent to Washington, D.C. to represent your state. This also messed up for Democrats back in 2018 when Phil Bredesen won every single county in his re-election bid in 2006, left office with a 70% plus approval rating, yet still ended up losing this Senate race by double digits. Phil Bredesen won three counties, came closer than many other Democrats, was a well-known name, but simply couldn't overcome the state's partisan history. So yes, North Carolina is different than those states, but those were popular governors. We're talking about a 50% plus approval rating for Steve Bullock and 70% plus for Phil Bredesen, yet both of them lost. It may be a swing state, but you're taking an unpopular governor and throwing them into that swing state. A state that hasn't shied away from electing Democrats as recently as 2020 in the old governorship that Pat McCrory used to hold. Looking at the results in North Carolina, we can actually see here how much uh, Roy Cooper won by. Because Donald Trump won by 1.3%, but then looking at the uh, governor's race, Roy Cooper won this state by 4.5%. So rather than just a four-point underperformance for the GOP, we actually saw around a 5.6.1 for the GOP this time. Roy Cooper isn't running in the Senate race, but the thing is, had it just been an issue of Pat McCrory, Roy Cooper would have been defeated by Dan Forrest. He was actually the incumbent lieutenant governor. So looking at Dan Forrest, he has someone who was, uh, actually we can go and look at 2016. Let's see if it shows us here, uh, zooming into North Carolina. Let's see, I don't know if it will show us. Um, we can just go ahead and check the Wikipedia page and then head over to the Lieutenant Governor election. Maybe it'll show it to us, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but the, the main thing is that North Carolina um, in 2020, had it just been an issue of Pat McCrory, I really do think that Roy Cooper would have lost. I think it is a combination of Roy Cooper being popular and just the fact that it was, you know, Pat McCrory was someone who, uh, I think Roy Cooper was individually a strong candidate, but I think that this wouldn't have happened had the bathroom bill not passed and had the state received uh, an economic hardship and a wave of criticism from the United States media that ultimately fell on the governor's office here back in uh, the 2012 to 2016 timeframe. And I honestly think that if Pat McCrory ends up the nominee, we are going to cover this race a lot more. I can guarantee you now, if Pat McCrory wins this nomination, which it looks like he might, because when faced up against a, a, a nomination field without Laura Trump, he seems to be doing well. Now, of course, I think this was actually an internal poll from Pat McCrory. We saw it released a few days ago, sort of indicating that he was going to run. I didn't want to speculate until he announced because saving the video until he announces. But just looking at the numbers here, if Laura Trump isn't here, Pat McCrory is doing better than everybody else. Everybody else. When you take out Laura Trump, he's doing better than everyone else. When you include her, he's doing better than everyone else except for her. So just looking at what Pat McCrory could do, I think that it'll be uh, quite an interesting primary. I think the only reason why he's polling so well is because he's a recognizable name. But at the end of the day, recognizable names in the Republican primary don't always win general elections. Being recognizable for the wrong reasons is not good. It may help you amongst your own party, which will never disapprove of Pat McCrory, but amongst the general populace, if you're like, that's the governor from the bathroom bill, that's the governor that we ousted on the same time we elected Trump, that means there was around 4% uh, 4 of voters who crossed over from Trump to the Democrats. I can imagine that would happen again. And considering Trump won, by less than half the margin the second time? Yeah, I'm not going to go here, uh, sit here and lie to you and say that Pat McCrory has a good chance of winning here. Because, you know, it is a chance, 
But if he ends up being that nominee, a lot more money is going to be invested in this race for the right reasons, because it's a winnable race if they do that. But just looking at the uh, ever-changing field, I think we are going to see possibly the inclusion of the lieutenant governor or Laura Trump um, or Ted Budd. The thing is here that the Republican Party really doesn't have much to worry about in terms of uh, their governorship. You know, the lieutenant governor can come and go. Uh, that's why we aren't seeing Roy Cooper run for this Senate race. Had he lost in 2020, maybe he would have. But also that would raise the same questions and the same uh, alarm that you shouldn't run a losing governor. But looking at the state of North Carolina, it's the last state the GOP wants to be competitive because they know once it does become competitive, that means a lot more money is going to be focused on the race, which means a lot of other states are going to be neglected. Maybe Georgia and Arizona will be given up to the Democrats in the name of defending their own seats. Who knows at this point? The Republican Party wants the least amount of states to be competitive, but based off the five retirements so far and the announcements of candidates in certain states that should not be there, uh, I think the GOP is going to be in for quite a surprising amount of trouble ahead of 2022. Not even to mention that this 2022 map is the most beneficial Senate map for the Democratic Party currently. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2022 United States Senate election videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all later today.